The American Society on Aging was founded in 1954. 66 years later, people are living prosperous and longer lives. However, many are living with social and economic inequities and inequalities. And the pandemic, it has reminded us that this country doesn't embrace aging. What will happen in 10 years when one in five Americans will be over 65? The American Society on Aging is transforming itself to tackle the challenges and invest in the opportunities that this demographic change will bring. The new ASA reflects our year-long programming and meaningful membership experience. The new ASA reflects our commitment to unite to empower and to champion all of you. But most importantly, the new ASA reflects our optimism for the future of aging. On behalf of everyone at the American Society on Aging, I am proud to introduce you to the new ASA. Learn more and join us at www.asaging.org. Welcome everyone, I'm Ken Dykewald and this is the 12th and last of the legacy interviews and boy do you have an interesting person to encounter in the next few minutes. Uh, often when I've interviewed folks I thought well they're a little bit like that person or they took after that person. Dr. John Rowe is a singular human as you will soon, soon see. Dr. Rowe kicked off his career as a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School and then in his 30s became the founding director of Harvard's Division on Aging. At the same time, he was chief of gerontology at Boston's Beth Israel Hospital. Then when he was only 41, he became president of New York's legendary Mount Sinai Hospital and School of Medicine. In that role, he guided the merger of five hospitals and then served as president and CEO of Mount Sinai NYU Health one of the nation's largest academic healthcare organizations. Remarkably, he was then recruited to serve as chairman and CEO of Aetna, one of the nation's leading healthcare insurers with revenue in the 20 billion range, so serious enterprise, with the hope of changing what was wrong with the US healthcare system. Dr. Rowe has also served as director of the MacArthur Foundation's Research Network on Successful Aging, is a co-author of the acclaimed book, Successful Aging. Since retiring from Aetna, he's now the Julius B. Richmond Professor of Health Policy and Aging at Columbia University's Mailman School of Health Public Health. Simultaneously, he also serves as president of the International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics. Oh, and in his spare time, he's the trustee of both the Rockefeller Foundation and Lincoln Center and serves as chairman of the board at the acclaimed Marine Biological Labs in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Welcome, Jack Rowe. Thank you, Ken. Pleasure to be here with you. Our pleasure. And I'll tell you what, we've got a pretty serious uh, discussion in front of us, but before I get into the serious stuff, I've got a few pictures here that were sent to us by you and your family. So let's, uh, let's take a look at what we've got, and maybe you can say a few words about each of these. Okay. So which Jack Rowe is this one? So this is Aetna and, and uh, what, uh, when I was the chairman and CEO of Aetna, they actually wanted me to pose for this picture in a white coat because <laughs> they, uh, they basically had terrible relationships with doctors. But I said that I thought that was a bridge too far. So uh, <laughs> I'm trying to look corporate here. All right, but I think we, Wait, we're going to get to a white coat. And who are these lovely folks with you? So that's my wife on one side, Valerie. And that's my mother, Elizabeth, obviously at a Christmas uh, family gathering. Uh, my mm -hmm. mother lived to her late 90s and uh, um, was uh, always very, very pleased with the fact that I was interested in geriatrics. Fantastic. All right, now here we got the white coat. So. There's a white coat. So that was when I was the president of the Mount Sinai Medical Center in the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York for 12 years. And um, 
as you can see from that, and I don't know what year that was taken, I was a pretty youngish CEO for a medical center, and there was a lot of skepticism about that. But uh, I do want to ask that because one of your mentors, also one of my mentors, was Dr. Robert Butler, who, uh, leaving the National Institutes on Aging, was setting up the geriatric programs at Mount Sinai. So he was your mentor, but I guess you then became his boss. I guess. That's the way I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> he right, didn't see it that way every day. <laughs> <it> was, <laughs> what's this wonderful picture? So here's my, my wife, Valerie, and I and our three daughters. I'm holding, uh, I'm holding Abigail. And Valerie is holding her twin sister, Rebecca. And in the middle is uh, our eldest daughter, Meredith. And they are all now uh, in their uh, 40s and uh, thriving. And then we've got this one special picture here. I'll tell you what. Remember those haircuts, Ken? Uh, you know, look, look like you were, just came right out of the Spin and Marty show. On <laughs> right, I think that's eighth grade. Uh, look at those outfits. Look at that zoot suit. It's something out of that. <laughs> that, that's the stuff they wore in that show, Guys and Dolls. Uh, yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's let's hold off on the pictures for now. And uh, if you're ready, I'm going to ask you to say what's in your mind and kind of put it out there like you see it. So you were born in Jersey City. Your dad was a professional soccer player and factory worker, and your mom was a hospital clerk. What drove you to be so incredibly productive in your life? Well, um, you know, my father, uh, as you say, was a professional soccer player. He emigrated here from the United Kingdom uh, when he was an adult and had played for several years. And he, he, had, uh, he had very little education. Neither of my parents went to high school, but, but he was really persistent. And, he, and I think that was the, the athlete in him. Um, and, and in order to excel and uh, in a very competitive sport. And I, I saw that as a, as a real role, a role model for me. He never gave up. Did you always want to work in healthcare when you were that little boy with that buzz cut hair? No, were you my, thinking one day I'm going to be a geriatrician? No, my mother, as you said, was a clerk in a, in a hospital admitting office. And she would sometimes bring me to the hospital and introduce me to doctors or tell me stories about patients that she had helped admit. But uh, so that was a, a little bit of a, a exposure, but I, uh, I had not, no one in our family was in healthcare. And I actually, that wasn't even obvious I was gonna go to college. So uh, uh, that, uh, that was not a goal. Wow, so, but then all of a sudden, there you are a nephrologist kidney right. specialist yeah. and somehow you got it in your head that you're going to turn in the direction of geriatrics jack what was going on what led you to that perspective when i was finishing my first year of residency um we were all getting drafted to go to saigon and i was given an opportunity to go to the national institutes of health and work in the laboratory and i got it to choose from several laboratories and uh, thought about different issues of what I might want to do. And it seemed to me there were three really important things that were going to come down at Pike. One of them was uh, the genome. Somebody was going to decode the human genome one day. Another was uh, environmental health. There had been neglect of the interaction of, of humans and animals with the environment. And then the third was aging, right? As you well know, as you have been the prophet of waking up and smelling the demographics for a long time. And uh, so I, I looked at those different laboratories and I decided to go to the Gerontology Research Center, which was then uh, part of the National Institute of um, Child Health and Development. There was no NIA. In really? That. So that was pre-NIA. And when I worked there with uh, Nathan Schock and Ruben Andrews for two years, I got completely turned on to the science of aging. 
So many people going to geriatrics do it because they're interested in the problems of older people, which is of course a good reason. I was interested in the basic biology of aging and, and the physiology of aging. All right, so back, let's just pause for a second. There are people who are watching this from all over the world and will be watching for years to come who might be in their 60s and 70s or others who are in college right now or in graduate school. They may not know who Nathan Chalk and Ruben Andrews are. Can you give us a little bit of a portrait? Well, Nathan Schock uh, was a PhD trained uh, scientist who was the leader of the Gerontology Research Center. And he uh, established the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, which is still going on, which is a very, very important uh, cohort of individuals who have been studied in detail through many dimensions throughout their adult, uh, adulthood and late life. Ruben Andrews was the director of the endocrinology and metabolism division of this research center. It included psychologists and sociologists and basic biologists and cardiologists. And Ruben was uh, an expert in issues related to obesity, diabetes, and the aging, uh, and those kinds of metabolic issues. He was my direct superior and a brilliant, brilliant guy. So when you deter determined that you had an interest in aging, how much of your interest in was in the elderly? How much of it was in aging? Well, I think it was really in aging until I got back to Harvard and uh, served a year as the chief resident in medicine. And I noticed that all the patients were old. <laughs> <laughs> they had been there before, but like most people, I kind of had neglected the age piece of, of the issue. And I said, you know, the physiology of aging that I've been studying for two years the changes in the heart and the kidney and the lung and the immune system with aging, they influence the presentation of the diseases in these people and the complications that ensue and their response to therapies. And nobody is studying the aging piece. It's just heart failure or lung failure. It's not heart failure in an older person. And that was the context that I saw as an opportunity. Did you get a resounding show of enthusiasm from your colleagues at Harvard? There were no other geriatricians at Harvard. There was no program in aging at Harvard. And uh, one of the reasons for that was that there was no interest. It was, you know, geriatrics was, was clearly viewed as a second class specialty. That the people who weren't in geriatrics, the very few of them were really not seen as leading clinicians and certainly not leading researchers. So no, I didn't get a lot of support from, from anybody um, except the Dean of the Medical School. For some reason, the Dean of the Medical School thought this was a good idea. No one else. Did people but try to talk? Good. If I was gonna have one person in my camp, that was the right guy. Did people try to talk you out of it? Yes, of course. Um, what, what was their argument? I was, offered, um, I was offered a couple faculty jobs uh, at Stanford and um, at Harvard and and the people at Harvard that offered me a job, I didn't apply. And, I, and they uh, they said, but you have to, none of this geriatric stuff, you have to become a, be in our nephrology unit. You know, we're not gonna tolerate this hobby of yours. You know, you're gonna be a nephrologist. And um, so that wasn't really attractive to me at that time. I, I, I was really turned on to aging. I was gonna go to the VA, which is was, at that time developing important programs in, in aging and geriatrics. But I wound up um, being talked into staying at Harvard, but as a geriatrician. Okay, so you were born in 1944. So your decision to essentially start a program in gerontology and geriatrics at Harvard, that was pretty darn pioneering, huh? Yeah, it just seemed obvious to me. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't know what the big deal about it was. And people were saying, well, you're going to ruin your career. And I say, well, you know, if this doesn't work, I'm, I still have a nephrology fe fellowship from the Mass General Hospital. <laughs> I still have an MD degree. I'm still working at Harvard Medical School. How bad can this be? I can, I mean, I'll be okay. But I want to try this first. Okay. So those of us who've had the pleasure of 
knowing you a bit or knowing you a lot and admiring your incredible pursuits and commitments and contributions over the years, may not know this about you, but you were raised Roman Catholic. And a lot of your education was brought forward, was provided by Jesuit training. What role is knowledge seeking and faith play in your life? I, I think um, I had eight years of Jesuit training, uh, high school and college. And I, I think um, the greatest lesson for me wasn't spirituality, but it was excellence. Hmm. Absolute commitment to excellence. Rigorous thought, rigorous discussion, rigorous evaluation, and no room for anything but that. Hmm. And, and, I, I, and that, was, that was the culture uh, of the Jesuits. And, um, you know, I went to St. Peter's Prep in Jersey City. That was the local Jesuit school. There were others across the river. There was one Regis High School where a guy named Tony, Tony Fauci went. <laughs> you may have, may have heard of him. He's a couple, uh, three years older than you, though, I believe. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that was, that was really what I learned there. Did, um, did you have any mentors? You mentioned several, Shock and Andrus, but did, did you have anyone that you thought of as that person is kind of guiding me or I want to be yes. like them? I, yeah, I certainly did. I had uh, a mentors uh, at Harvard. Uh, Franklin Epstein uh, was uh, one of my mentors. Eugene Braunwald was one of my mentors. Uh, and um, I, I, really, I really learned a lot uh, about surviving in uh, that academic environment. And I also learned a lot about how to plan a career, you know, and, and that is really important because uh, too many uh, individuals uh, lack guidance with respect to what kind of research to do or how to do it. And uh, the, the usual tendency is to go from idea to idea to idea, whatever seems like an interesting opportunity, and they wind up without the development of a systematic body of work. Which so I let me ask a question about that. Not being a bioscientist, it appears that scientists do work on something for a while, then work on something else for a while, or fixate on one thing and don't let it go for the course of their life. When you said you were given some career insight, what was your strategy regarding science? My, my strategy was to carve out an area that was broad enough that I could do different kinds of projects, but then narrow enough that the accumulated evidence that I was developing had a theme. So my piece was the physiology of aging. Wow. And within that, my piece was metabolism but I could study kidney function. I could study diabetes. I could study lipids. That's all part of metabolism. So I had a group working with me on different kinds of projects, but there was no brain studies, okay? Wow. <laughs> there was no, no immunology. It was all within the highway of the physiology of aging in the lane of metabolism but it wasn't, I was only studying thyroid hormone in the elderly over and over again, you know. It, it, was, it was broad enough to have some variety. So I'm curious. You're at Harvard, perhaps the greatest educational institution in the world. You were starting a new territory. Did it strike you that that was either entrepreneurial or odd or what? It was obvious. Just was obvious. obvious. Yeah, it was just so obvious. I mean, it was, the, the striking thing to me was that this hadn't been done before there. You know, I, I mean, what were they waiting for? 
it was just obvious. Some people, when they see a territory that hasn't been done before, they steer clear. You dove in, huh? Yeah, yeah, I, I dove in because I, I, I was really interested in it. It wasn't just an opportunistic thing. I think opportunism is, it's not a four letter word. And, you know, it's, it's a, not a bad thing. The, when the guy on third base steals home because the ball gets thrown over the catcher's head, that's opportunistic, but it's okay, you know? He's expected to do that. But I didn't do it because nobody else had done it. I did it because I was really interested in it. And I was really surprised nobody else had done it, or very few other people. And so I really didn't have a cadre of colleagues, you know. So can I can only imagine what this uncharted territory might have looked like to the young Jack Rowe. But were you thinking, I'm going to cause aging to be stopped? like some people are talking about now, so people can live to 500? Or are you thinking I can eliminate disease? Or are you thinking I was going to create a subspecialty of medicine? What was, did you have anything that you thought you were going after? Um, I, I would say that uh, I wanted to build a body of research. That was my principal goal. That was what was driving me an interest in the research. And by the way, I should mention that my timing was great because the National Institute on Aging had just been founded. And they were seeking scholars to support. And here I was with two years of training at the Gerontology Research Center, which was then part of the National Institute on Aging. So I was a member of the club. It was a very small club. And I knew if I, if I did good work, I would get support from NIA. And I got a lot of support from NIA for many years. And that's a, that's a credential at Harvard, okay? That's the coin of the realm. If you can get NIH support, people start paying attention to you. But the other thing I wanted to do, in addition to the research, was I wanted to help build the infrastructure for the field. I wanted to help the professional associations. I wound up founding some things. I, I was one of the founders of the American Federation for Aging Research, AFAR. I was a, a founding board member of the Buck Institute in Marin County. Um, I was on the board of the American Board of Internal Medicine when we established specialization and certification accreditation in geriatric medicine. I was on the committee that wrote the first exam. Wow. So, you know, so I was, I was trying to, uh, to help the field establish uh, the, the professionalization of it so that it would be more respected because that is what's required to uh, be sustainable. So I imagine there are some folks watching this program who are dreaming of, like you, being pioneers, being navigators into a new territory. Um, but it would appear you had no failures in your early decades. I'm assuming you had some failures or you faced adversity. How did you deal with it? What did you draw upon when things were going not well? You know, I, I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson in clinical medicine that I tried to apply to myself when things didn't, when an experiment didn't work or a grant didn't get funded or whatever. And that was that, that my observation was that um, having a successful life in late life it is not about avoiding having bad things happen. You can't do that. Bad things are gonna happen. It's about resilience. It's about getting back up. The patients who get back up and recover and get re-engaged and go on with their life. And, and there are a lot of determinants of that. And I think that social support is a critically important one that now we recognize much more than we used to. But I think that, that I was not a quitter and, and I just got back up and I, I learned that from those patients. Thank you. Last question in this section. As you look back over your career so far, and we're in a little while, we're gonna to get to what's coming. Uh, what do you think are the most valuable contributions you've made or, or what are you most proud of? Well, I, I would have a couple kind of categories. I mentioned already the, 
the kind of institution building. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, uh, that was worthwhile. Um, and, uh, you know, serving as president of the Gerontological Society, I was editor in chief of the Journal of Gerontology. I took these leadership roles and I think that that, that was worthwhile. I, the second category would of course be research and uh, the work on the physiology of aging and then the, the work on successful aging with my colleagues in the MacArthur Network. And that's not an idea that everybody likes, but the paper that we wrote in science is still the most cited paper in gerontology in the world. Now I joke to people, everybody cites it because they want to criticize it and they have to cite it more than <laughs> criticize it. But the, but the fact is that it's there. It's a theory, it's out there. It's got a lot of attention. There are lots of centers on successful aging in universities and, and so on. So that would be a piece. And then I think a, a so third piece or a final piece would be the training. I, uh, you know, I, I had a bunch of fellows. I trained Neil Resnick. I trained Lou Lipsitz. I trained Ken Meineke. I trained uh, George Cushell. Uh, you know, I, uh, Grady Manili uh, up in Vancouver. So I, I had a large number of fellows who, uh, who have gone on to lead programs and to make important contributions to the field. And, and so that's a piece of the legacy that I really like. Thank you. So let's turn the corner a little bit to talk about the field of aging itself. But I need to, as I've been doing, I need to begin by asking you the question, what do you think the role of an older person ought to be in this new era? Well, I think that the important uh, theme here is uh, social capital. And uh, this is something that I've really learned from my colleague, Linda Freed, who is, of course, the dean of the Midland School, where my my appointment is, and is one of your interviewees. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, she's put great emphasis on the, uh, the capacity of uh, older individuals, individually and as a group, to, uh, to make contributions to society. And uh, if they are given the opportunity uh, to engage, either in work for pay or volunteering, such as in her experience core that she developed with Mark Friedman. Um, I, I think that the, the social capital piece is, is a really important piece. And we need as a, as a society to develop the institutions that facilitate that and permit it. <laughs> so, so in the absence of that having been established uh, and in these early decades of people living beyond their working years and even living decades in many cases beyond. Uh, when I look at the last decade that the average retiree watched 47 hours of television a week and only 24% volunteered. So therefore, a lot of people think retirement is a time to have a big vacation for 15, 20 years. Do you not agree with that or do you think it was a hybrid? I, I uh... I don't agree with it at all. I think that uh, um, retire retirement is is a reward, I guess, in some ways for people, but it's bad for your brain and it's bad for your body. Well, wait, say more. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Say more about that. What do you mean? Well, you know, I uh, I think that um, there are data to support. There are bodies of evidence that support the idea that people who are engaged uh, do better than people who retire and do not volunteer. Um, you gave that figure of 24% of people volunteer, but but we've learned things about that, Ken. So what we've learned is that if you don't volunteer while you're working, you have a 24% chance roughly of volunteering after you retire, unless you marry a volunteer. Hmm. But if you start volunteering while you're working, well, you have an 80% chance of volunteering. Never knew that, never heard that before. So, so what we need therefore is programs for later life workers to have flexible hours so they can start to build in volunteering in whatever what, the way they like, you know, uh, before they retire. And so they can transition. And the retirement is becoming a process. It's not a cliff anymore, right? It's a ramp. 
By the way, you're 77, I believe. Are you retired? Yeah. No, I work full time at, at Columbia University. I'm teaching teaching two courses uh, this coming semester. Were you delighted to become a senior citizen? I didn't notice. <laughs> so you didn't allow that cliff to happen. No, I'm for, look, I'm a lucky guy. The, the kinds of things that I do for a living are not the kinds of things that are physically demanding. And I've, my health has been good. And, um, uh, but it, 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 w it never occurred to me to retire. I mean, I, 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 I didn't even, I got a call from Social Security when I was 70 saying, you have to take your Social Security. <laughs> You have not signed up, you know, and I said, oh, all right, you know, so, um, so that's my point of view. All right, so I'm going to widen the lens just for a few moments here. So in addition to what you've done, I think those of us who have marveled over you for these, for this last half century have come to the conclusion that there has never been anyone as brilliant as you in the aging field and may never be again. You don't have to say anything to that. So partly how you think is captivating. You have probably thought about what the challenges are for an aging society, even though you began by studying the aging of the individual body, but you probably thought about the social body, the global body. What are the major challenges in your mind presented to all of us by an aging society? I would start with ageism. Uh, this innate negative view of older persons as individuals and as group, the greedy geezers mm -hmm. who are soaking up all the benefits to the disadvantage of, uh, of middle-aged people. So ageism is one challenge. What's so another? That's one. I, I think uh, intergenerational cohesion is a very important challenge that we look, we tend to look when we study societies at, at age groups. And we really should look at all age groups, not just a particular age group. It's, and it's not the elderly versus the children, it's the elderly and the children. And so I think intergenerational issues. I think equity is very important, you know. Okay, so the word equity has become powerful more than ever before in the last 24 months. What do you mean by equity? What I mean is an equitable distribution of resources across the older population rather than increasing camps, camps of haves and have nots. So I'm not referring to a racial uh, issue or a gender issue. I'm, I'm just talking about e economic issues. That's, that's the way I would look at it. I think that uh, uh, we need financial security for older people. And if you don't have that, then you can't get anything else. <laughs> if you've got food insecurity, if, if you don't have shelter, you can't start talking to people about how they should be volunteering. Okay, you know, <laughs> so you got to feed them. So you need financial security. You need equitability across uh, the older population. You need intergenerational issues uh, in relations. You need well-being, obviously, health status, access to health care. And I think you really need engagement, productivity and engagement. You have to have people, you have to have a society when you look at it, Ken, where people have the opportunity to participate, key. But to what extent does society render people as they age less relevant versus people render themselves less relevant by not staying connected or by not pursuing engagement or by going off and living in an age ghetto, as Maggie Kuhn would say. What extent is it society, is it systemic, societal, versus it's individual controlled? Um, well, first of all, you know more about this. <laughs> it's funny that my answering this question for you, but, uh, but my view is that, uh, that many societies uh, do not have the institutions that permit older people to be engaged and age successfully. Uh, if you think about the core institutions of our society, education, work, retirement, 
healthcare. These were not designed to serve a population with the age distribution of our current and future population. We need to redesign those core institutions so they can be enablers. Because if you really want to get engaged as an old person, you really strive to age successfully, but you're in a lousy environment <laughs> without mm -hmm. any of these institutions to support you, then it's very, very difficult. So it, it, it's not the person, I think it's the context. And if, if, if you're going to identify a criticism of the successful aging theory, which I think is a fair criticism, is that there wasn't enough attention early on to context. As I go back and read that stuff that we wrote, I think that there needed to be more context in there. And, 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 and that's an important lesson that I think I've learned. Okay, so I'm gonna insert myself into this a little bit. Um, I, I've, like you, I've liked to try to relanguage some of these issues because, you know, I introduced the word elder care years ago and age wave and holistic health. And, and then in 1990, I, by accident, actually introduced this concept of healthy aging. You were coming forward with successful aging. Other people were talking about anti-aging. Other folks were talking about ageless aging. If you had to pick a word or a phrase now that you think could hold the new planning for the future, what would you pick today? Well, um, I, I, think, I think one of the important things is to get rid of aging and emphasize longevity. Mm, say more about that. Well, I think that gives you a sense. No, wait, wait. You're the director of gerontology or Mr. Aging, you're successful aging. Wait a minute, you're telling us we should dump aging? No, we should, we should improve it uh, by uh, emphasizing <laughs> longer lives. Because when you start talking about longevity as opposed to aging, you, you automatically put things in the life course perspective. And I think that's the direction to go. Because Why? we've learned that throughout life, particularly at crucial critical events, maybe like adolescence, uh, midlife in some ways, there is the accrual of advantage or disadvantage. And that those actions and events have very long arms. And, um, and we have learned, for instance, that paid parental leave <laughs> keeps women in the workforce longer. And if they're in the workforce longer, guess what? They get better pensions, mm -hmm. <laughs> they have more economic stability as they enter late life. I mean, so it's the, taking this longer view, I think would be an important part of what I would, if I were starting over in, in developing a center or a unit at a university, that would be in the mission statement. Thank you. All right, so I now- point, point by the very quickly to Laura Carstensen at Stanford in the mm -hmm. Stanford Center on Longevity. That's what she called it when she started it 10 or 15 years ago not the Stanford Center on Aging. That was the first example I know of of that. Well, I'll give you one historical moment here uh, from, the, from the popular culture. Back 40 years ago, I was a regular on the Merv Griffin show. For those of you who can remember Merv Griffin, and they said, what are you going to talk about when you come on each month? And I said, aging. And they said, oh, that's a terrible subject. And I said, well, longevity, great subject. And I, said, <laughs> no. I said, you know, it's kind of the same stuff. And they said, yeah, but aging word is, yeah. but longevity. But so you feel we're entering into this era of appreciation for life course, and you would lean into the word longevity more than you ever have before. Yeah, I think obviously you were well ahead of the game there, but I think there's more, there's more receptivity now, and there's more research. There's been a lot of uh, social and psychological and other kinds of research about the life course. Okay, so now I'm going to go into the belly of the beast here. You have been championing a new vision for geriatric competency. Uh, first of all, let's establish it. What are the three missions of strengthening geriatric care, according to Jack Rowe? And in terms of geriatric care, I guess I would... Uh, I, I'm, my biggest concern is the elder care workforce. Uh, it's it, inadequate quantitatively and qualitatively, and uh, it includes inadequacies for physicians, 
uh, it, it inadequacy for nurses and the uh, nurse opportunities to practice at the full extent of their license and grossly inadequate workforce and long-term care. Okay, so less than one percentage of the entire medical workforce has received any certification in geriatrics. Is that okay? And, and it's falling, <laughs> it's not rising. Think about that. Um, and, and one of the reasons is economic. You know, if, if I'm practicing internist, Ken, and I decide to dedicate my entire practice to uh, elderly, my income falls about $70,000 because now all my patients are on Medicare. Whereas before I had a mix of commercially insured patients and Medicare beneficiaries. And Medicare refuses to acknowledge that older people being treated by certified geriatricians are getting more value than by individuals with no training in geriatrics. Has anybody tried to be mean about it? That is to say, we're not going to pay you, we being Medicare, we're not going to pay you, Mr. or Mrs. Doctor, unless you receive some specialized training and competencies in geriatric assessment or polypharmacy or whatever other things you would make as a curriculum. Has that ever been considered? Rather than um, just making nice well, and paying it, everybody the, the way, same. The way the Medicare benefits are structured and organized by Congress, that's not feasible. What, what some people have done on the other side, the carrot rather than the stick, is they have said, like the VA, if you get certification in geriatrics, we'll give you a bonus. So they've done things like that. Um, but if, I, if I'm a doc or a nurse and I have no interest in learning anything about older people, and so I'm winging it, I'm still going to be paid the same amount by Medicare as somebody who's gone to the trouble of learning how to do the job. That's right. If I were president, I'd change that. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. All right. So let's play with that for a second. First of all, are you contemplating running for president? No. Okay. But if you were the president and you had three changes to make pertaining to preparing America for its longevity, what would those changes be if you were the president of the United States? Sure. Well, were I president, uh, I would uh, change the Medicare payment uh, policies for geriatrics geriatricians and for nurse practitioners uh, so that they could get uh, paid more equitably. Number two is I would invest more in geroscience, uh, probably through the National Institute on Aging. Uh, they have a science, basic science program, but too much of it, well, hard to say too much, but a lot of it goes to Alzheimer's disease and not much to the basic science of aging, which I think is underserved and has great opportunity right now. A lot of interesting things going on. And number three is I would appoint a geriatrician to be Surgeon General of the United States of America. <laughs> I, right before COVID, did a briefing for the Secretaries of Health and Human Services for all of the states and the regions that America controls. And there was only two geriatricians out of 55 people and about 40 pediatricians. And knowing that the population is aging and gonna live long lives, that seemed to me to be nuts. That's a, it's a no brainer. And not only do we spend an, an exorbitant proportion of our healthcare expenditures on the elderly, right? But they vote. I mean, <laughs> what is the downside <laughs> to sending a message saying, we're going to appoint a geriatrician surgeon general. Never been. Would you, would you be interested in that assignment? Oh, sure. But that's not why I'm proposing this. You know, I okay. mean, I don't, there are a lot of 77 year old guys who get a. I don't know, Anthony, you know, we just got a 78 year old president yeah, and no, got an 80 year old cool. Anthony Fauci. So I wouldn't yeah. say that you're too old, but I'm not no. proposing you for this. But yeah, yeah. okay. No, but, but, but let sure, me ask you I mean, another question. I, I think. Uh, and it may be that when some people hear me say this, they think I'm campaigning, which I'm not. But, but I think it would be a really cool move. I'm going to let some pause around that so we all take that in. 
that considering that people over 50 can shroom, consume about two thirds of all the healthcare in America, right. and that we're the fastest growing segment of our population are the very old, to not have a geriatrician as Surgeon General doesn't seem to be smart. Question for you. A few years ago, we all took note of John Beard working for the World Health Organization, creating a, a whole healthy aging initiative. Uh, but then, and I may have this wrong, and I met John a few times, but it seemed to me right after he did that, they retired him. Um, there's something a little wacky about that. Um, ageism. <laughs> uh, ingrained, built in, built into the DNA of many uh, bureaucratic organizations that limits flexibility. Very hard to get some of those rules changed. I think the WHO has since changed that rule, but it is uh, ironic at the least and absurd <laughs> at the most mm -hmm. that the head of the Healthy Aging Initiative at the World Health Organization is forced to retire because of his age. And it wasn't like he was 80, you know, he was in his so, so I'm gonna ask you to put on your way back machine hat for a second. I was lucky when I was 30, I collaborated on a book with Jonas Salk, who one night over dinner explained to me the difference between building more iron lungs and stopping polio. Do, can you look into the future and imagine a future in which we will have stopped or eliminated Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, Parkinson's, cancer, diabetes, or do you think we're just gonna keep trying to tinker with them? I think that we, can get to the point where we basically have a life without those diseases that you mentioned. I don't know that we'll be able to prevent infectious disease. Mm. I don't know that we'll be able to have equity in the population so that the social determinants of health are, don't continue to drive the majority of ill health in the country. But it seems to me uh, clear that some of the specific diseases you mentioned, think of the advances we've made in, in, in cancer care in the last couple of years in certain kinds of cancer. And, and uh, we haven't cracked the nut of Alzheimer's disease yet, but I can't understand that that wouldn't happen at some point. Um, I'm optimistic about that. Do you think that the ability to, as you say, square the curve or, you know, Jim Freeze is compre compressing morbidity so that we live long, abundantly healthy lives. Do you think that's going to become because behavioral change, people eat healthier and exercise more and such, or do you think it's going to be, these things are going to be beaten in the lab? I think the most interesting observation with respect to that was a paper, I think in 2019 by a guy named Cantu, uh, who, who showed, and Eileen Crimmins at USC and others have, have done important work in this area as well, that when it comes to compression of morbidity, um, it, it is continuing to happen in higher socioeconomic status groups, and it is stalled in lower socioeconomic groups. So educational attainment, financial security, these are the issues. These are the issues that are driving the stagnation of compression of morbidity. And so it's not the overall population that we have to think about now. What we have to start thinking about is um, the specific subsets which are disadvantaged. And the answer to that is not the laboratory testing. What is the answer? The answer is policies and programs that facilitate opportunity. And I'm not saying everybody has to get everything, you know, or everything has to be equal, you know, and I, I'm not, it doesn't bother me that my friend Steve Schwarzman makes more money than I do. I have enough, it's okay, I have what I need, you know. I mean, that's not what I'm saying, but what I am saying is that there are important pockets of the population which have shown that they are no longer making progress with respect to healthy aging. And then we need to turn the microscope down to that population. So imagine we're looking at a newspaper 
and the newspaper announces that scientists have determined way before there's amyloid and tau, there are some activities going on in the human organism that can be turned off so that it never finds itself with Alzheimer's or other related serious cognitive loss diseases. What year would that newspaper headline be in? 2030. I hope so. I hope so. You know, I just think the biology, the tools, uh, CRISPR. I mean, think it's like the eighth day of creation. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all right, all right. So I got a question for you. I reread your 2008 Institute of Medicine report, and it first of all it was brilliant, and it outlined a blueprint for fixing our healthcare system, top to bottom. Everything from care workers to medical system to reimbursement. Yeah, and I'm not sure that all of those great ideas have happened. If there were a myth, a Greek or Roman myth that describes how you feel about that, what would that myth be? Sisyphus. You know? <laughs> Just push that rock up that hill every time. <laughs> Come back the next morning and there it is. And uh, why can't I get this rock to go up this hill? And is it me? Or are there forces countervailing? Uh, or is it structural lag? Matilda White Riley taught us about the fact that it takes a long time for certain institutions to change their structure. All right, so since a lot of young students and professionals are kind of living in a TikTok hyperspeed world, they might hear you say that and think, oh, he spent half a century on this and it's still. <laughs> Um, what advice would you give to future change makers if they really want to make an impact in the field of aging or working with elders? What advice would you give? Well, I, I think that uh, if they want to do research, that it's really important for them, number one, to become expert in aging. They have to master the information. Too many people dive in and they don't understand what they're talking about outside of their individual lab or their individual research project. They don't read the literature, they don't read the older literature, and they don't understand the flow of ideas over time. So you have to really be expert, you know? So uh, it, it's, it, there's a difference between being an expert on um, the influence of technology on the workforce or being an expert economist who happens to be studying the influence of technology in the workforce. Those are two different kinds of people. So number one, you have to get credibility uh, in the field. The second thing is that you have to make sure you don't ask unimportant questions. The biggest- You don't ask unimportant questions. The biggest trap is to ask a question that pops up right in front of you. It's a good opportunity. You think you can get it funded. You think you might know the answer, but it's the trivial question. Whoa, so whoa, that requires that one understand a hierarchy of importance. To that's answer. right, that's right. Where, do you learn, where does one learn that? By studying the field and understanding the field. And uh, because a lot of these things are scientific cul-de-sacs. And, and uh, they, they kind of look good for a while, but boom, pretty soon you're at the end of the road and, and you haven't made a difference on anything. So you have to make sure you are not asking unimportant questions. What advice would you give to a next generation of train make, uh, change makers to their psyche and their soul about what it takes to be a change maker? Well, I think uh, it's important to understand that uh, there's not a style of leadership, there's not a style of change maker. You don't have to mimic somebody. Some of them are great speakers, some of them are not so great speakers. <laughs> some of them have certain kinds of education and certain degrees, others don't have those degrees. So there's no kind of leadership equation Hmm. Uh, very few people have that innate ability um, 
very rare. I mean, I get, it's like mathematics, you know, uh, Newton got it, okay? He got it, he got it all. But most of us have to learn it. <laughs> Some of us learn it better than others, but we have to learn it and we have to make mistakes. And, uh, uh, and then I think it's important for people to understand that there's a difference between leadership and management. Explain. They, Please explain. Then, Please explain. What, I'll tell you what, before you answer that, I'm going to go sideways for a second. Many people probably are aware, but in case you're not. So here's Dr. John Rowe, perhaps the most brilliant geri geriatric mind and researcher and thinker in the world. And then I got a call one day saying, Jack has just been recruited to run Aetna. And I'm like, what? He's now a businessman mega? What were you thinking when that happened? And by the way, it is public knowledge that being a humble researcher academician, you came away with around $100 million from that, which you and your wife are now deploying back into public programs. I was at Buck two weeks ago and I walked in and there's the Valerie and John Rowe Auditorium. So you're giving it away, you're, you're doing good things with it. But what were you thinking by attempting to be a business manager of a major not-for-profit insurer? Well, um, when Edna was doing terribly, it was really uh, in the ditch. And um, they were having major problems with uh, physicians who were suing them because their business practices were terrible and they were, you know, denying claims here, here and there. And they decided they needed a physician leader. And I had been running this large medical center and medical school in New York that you mentioned. So I was on their list and, and I went and I, I never thought about working in a company and I certainly didn't know anything about insurance, but I promised uh, somebody I knew there that I would talk with them. And as I talked to people, I, um, I made a diagnosis. And I, it's like, if you're a consultant physician, Ken, at, at a major hospital, uh, and you get called to see the tough cases, difficult, puzzling cases. And, and you may go in the room to see a patient and the best cardiologist in the hospital is there and the best psychiatrist and the best neurologist and the best orthopedist and the best allergist. And you walk in the room, you get to the foot of the bed, you look at the patient and you know the diagnosis. Hmm. Now, and you felt that with regard to- And a that happens company. like once a year. And maybe mm -hmm. something happened with the patient that made it more obvious or whatever, but bam, you get the diagnosis. I got the Aetna and I talked to the people running the company and I made the diagnosis. And, uh, and it was, just simply stated, I mean, they thought they were in the insurance business and they weren't, they were in the healthcare business. So I talked to the guy running the healthcare part of the company, 95% of the company, right? What few revenues they had came from healthcare. I said, how long have you been in this job? Two to three years. So how long have you been with the company? 30 years, that was a stock answer. Everybody had been there 30 years. Hmm. I said, what did you do before you ran this? He said, I ran property and casualty in the Philippines. That's the diagnosis. Hmm. All right, now tell me the difference between a leader and a manager. Well, we don't have a lot of time very quickly. You know, managers do, do things right and leaders do the right things. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. So we have a few minutes to go and I've got a few personal questions to ask you, my friend. And um, so first I've been asking everyone in your own life. So you were a young guy running gerontology, geriatrics at Harvard thirties. Now you're a guy in your late seventies. Has your aging been an ascent or has it been a descent personally? I'm going sideways. <laughs> Meaning? Meaning I think uh, intellectually, I feel uh, good. I don't, you know, I think uh, my cognitive function is more or less the same and certain aspects of it are less good and certain others 
maybe even better as as all the psychologists have shown over many years mm -hmm. phase of kinds of of uh of capacities go in different directions but i think that's fine and physically i'm not as strong or as quick as i was but i and basically in that period, I think there are an awful lot of people who have benefited from good health care and a lot of educational attainment and good social support like I have with my family, who basically between 65 and late 70s, they go sideways, is my sense. In the modern Question. Era. You have been a man of extraordinary influence and power. Do you feel your influence and power works in the same kind of general equation as when you were a young man, or is it different now? I think the roles are, are different and the targets are different. And I'm much more interested in institutional change, policies and programs, rather than building the infrastructure of a sustainable field. Do you feel you have more leverage as an older man than you did as a younger man? Yes. Is it a little bit more? or is it exponentially more? It's focal. I, I have a lot more influence in certain ways. Um, you know, in certain programs that I advise or help lead, I have a lot more influence. Then other areas, my influence has waned. Okay, last two questions, personal questions. Let's, let's go into a time machine here. If 77-year-old Jack Rowe could travel back in time and be sitting beside the young Jack, the age of 20, uh, what would you tell him about the life that's about to unfold? I would tell him that he has more time than he thinks he does to prepare to make a difference and that the period of uh, potential productive engagement that he's going to have is gonna be longer than he thinks. And he should prepare for it better by getting more training, not less. You know, I skipped a couple of years of my training and stuff like that. I was a guy in a hurry, you know, couldn't wait to get out there. If you were able to go back and sit with the 20 year old you, and if he were to say to you, hey, give me a glimpse, how did the life turn out? You think he'd be proud of you? Yeah, I, I, I think in, in some ways, yeah, I, I think I think it's worked out. I mean, I've been very, very fortunate and there are things I, I, I haven't done that I wished I could do. And, but, but I think I've been, Look at look at where we are. I mean, I've been really, really incredibly fortunate, and uh, and I was able. I was lucky to get through. I got through this early period of my career uh, in, at Harvard, working twenty four seven, and somehow my family stayed together. You know, mm -hmm. and that's a big, big thing, right? To have that support there. So, last question, my friend. <clears throat> Imagine now it's decades from now, many decades. You're gone, I'm gone. All the interview subjects from this series are gone. What more than anything would you like for people to say about Dr. John Rowe or Jack Rowe? Jack Rowe, well, he yeah, was. I, I think that I'd like to be considered to be one of the people who helped build the field of aging in the United States. Well, I'd like to say to you that um, I have marveled at your brilliance, at your tenacity, at your resilience, at your courage. I've watched you take on different and more complicated assignments, and there really isn't anyone else quite you. And so we are all grateful to all that you've done and hope that you're still only in the middle of the game. <laughs> I'm, eager, I'm well, eager to see now that you're a little wiser than you used to be, and even though you don't move as fast and strong, what you can manifest in these years ahead. So thank you for all that you are and all that you've done, Jack. Well, thank you, Ken, for uh, your leadership of this very important, interesting project, and I hope it's 
it's going to be useful to uh, to the people who who take a look at it. And, and okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do something that I was not planning on doing, and I've not done in an interview. Why do you think this is an interesting project? You have overseen MacArthur projects, Institute of Medicine, Academy it, of Science it, projects. Back to what Why I, do you think this is interesting? It, it gets back to what I said about if somebody was starting in the field, I would tell them to go immerse themselves in the field and become an expert. Know all the theories of aging. Know all the important research. Not, you know, et cetera. Not just their real narrow idea of diabetes type two diabetes and elderly women living alone in Appalachia or something, you know, and, and become an expert. Looking at these 12 interviews is part of that process. Familiarizing yourself with people and with ideas and phases in the emergence of this, uh, this field. Excellent. Thank you. Wishing you and Valerie and your kids all the best. Thank hope you. To see you again. When, hope to see you again in the years ahead. Take sure. good care. Bye. Bye-bye.